Before we begin, this video is sponsored by Raycon. For many of you, Mother's Day is just around the corner, and when you ask a mother what they want, the common response is simply peace and quiet. And what better way to tune out the noises of a non-stop world and tune into something that makes you feel great than with a fresh pair of Raycon earbuds. Raycon Everyday Earbuds provide excellent premium sound quality that rivals big audio brands at only a fraction of the price. I use them literally every single day, and I've done so for years with no issue. Just last month, in fact, I was traveling in New York, and Raycon earbuds got me through two grueling 8-hour flights thanks to their optimized gel tips that provide comfort for extended use, and their 8 hours of playtime and 32-hour battery life meant I could seamlessly tune in and out during my travels without needing to stop and charge. When out and about, the barrage of city sounds can be overwhelming, so using their tap functionality, I use noise isolation to immerse myself in podcasts to entertain me for hours while seated, and then with a quick switch to awareness mode, I can stay connected without jeopardizing my safety in the city that never sleeps. Even if your mom's a homebird like mine, they're just as perfect for those simpler, tranquil moments on the couch after a long day, and with the 30-day return and tens of thousands of five-star reviews, I cannot strongly recommend Raycon enough as not only the perfect Mother's Day gift, but also just the perfect gift in general for you and your loved ones. You can support my channel today by clicking the link in the description box below or going to buyraycon.com slash Ryan to get 20% off your Raycon purchase plus free shipping. Antrim is said to be the deadliest film ever made. Well, by its own admission, of course, which are big shoes to fill for such a profoundly bold claim, a concern its filmmakers even admit. It tells the story of a lost English-Bulgarian film from 1979 that's believed to be cursed after it became associated with a string of bizarre deaths inflicted on those who purportedly watched the film. In 1983, it circulated around various film festivals but was rejected by everyone, with each festival programmer dying in random, seemingly incidental dental circumstances, such as seizures, electrocution, and standing on an extremely rare venomous fish. However, strangest of all was in 1988 during a screening in Budapest, where witnesses outside were quoted as saying it looked as if the theatre had erupted into a monument of fire, killing all 56 audience members inside. While firefighters and forensic investigators initially assumed it was an accident stemming from the projector room, to their shock they discovered the origins of of not one, but multiple fires within the audience, implying self-immolation. Many years later, in 1993, after being notoriously dubbed the movie that kills, a San Francisco theatre decided to screen the film as a spooky event, but the atmosphere quickly soured when the audience burst into hysteria and discovered themselves locked inside, resulting in riots and fighting, tragically leading to a pregnant woman being trampled to death. However, assuming the curse is in fact real and will kill those who watch the film, the real cause of the hysteria technically prevented further deaths when a theatre employee eventually confessed to spiking the audience's popcorn with LSD. Regardless, it's a brooding and powerfully engrossing setup, built firstly on superstition and then brought into reasonable doubt by the events in San Francisco, as various filmmakers, scholars and programmers continue to question the origins of the film. It cuts to the bone in addressing the stimulating magic of cinema lost in an age where we're so desensitised and accustomed to movie-making tricks. But more so, it's about the symbolic relationship that magic once had in our perception of heaven, hell, and the abyss of the unknown, where fear and what drives it can be provoked with mere signs and visuals that trigger something visceral in our subconscious. So, does the film live up to how it's sold in the opening? Absolutely not, but the vibes it gives off are chef's kiss perfection. Just remember to tamper your expectations somewhat, because Antrim is not going to be for everyone. It's the kind of film that will leave you with more questions and answers, but its ambition is worth a curious watch, even if this is the rare film where it seems more designed for horror purists than for casual audiences, so you've been warned. The real meat of the story begins when the producers of the Framing mockumentary obtain a copy of the film at an auction in 2018, 15 years after all copies seemingly dropped off the face of the earth, and now I wish to present the public with a completely unaltered version of the supposedly cursed film. 
However, discretion is advised that because the origins of this copy are unknown and more than likely passed through various owners, there's a strong chance it's been tampered with, so there's no way to determine for sure if this version is an original or something else entirely. I will discuss the visual peculiarities within the 35mm print at the end of the video, but if you decide to be out and watch it for yourself, I highly recommend watching it with earbuds, nudge nudge wink wink, because the film uses binaural audio illusions to supposedly stimulate different sound frequencies in the brain to provoke sensations and emotional reactions. Whether or not it works, I genuinely do not know, they might be full of shite, but sound engineer Brock Frickner does explain it in the end, yet really the effect is more so down to how various signs are isolated to specific ears to create a sense that something surrounds you at all times or is creeping over your shoulder to put you on edge. It's certainly a neat trick, all things considered. Anyway, after a 50 second legal disclaimer passing all liability onto the viewer in the event anything bad were to happen to them, Antrim itself tells the story of a brother and sister attempting to rescue the soul of their recently deceased dog Maxine. After Maxine is euthanized for attacking the youngest sibling Nathan, he's left fearful at his mother's comments that Maxine is now in hell, prompting his sister Orly to fabricate a ritual to free Maxine's soul in the hopes it will bring comfort and closure to Nathan. She takes him to a suicide forest to find the spot where the devil supposedly landed when he was cast out of heaven, which she claims has become the Antrim, the entrance to hell. Now, I assume the forest itself is a reference to Akigahara or the Sea of Trees in Japan, known for being the spot of some of the world's highest suicide rates, along with its association to Yori supernatural mythology, which is modestly alluded to in some aspects of the film. When I say the vibe feels off, I mean it is off the cliff into uncomfortable oblivion. It makes use of a dizzying dreamlike score, a washed out 70s film grain, voyeuristic cinematography, almost hallucinogenic editing and sound, particularly when superimposing faintly creepy sublimable imagery and symbols that, if you blink you'll miss them, and of course get your drinks ready for phrases Ryan always says, the festering loss of innocence through Nathan, who's plagued with nightmares of demons and a satanic effigy, triggering strong Wicker Man vibes. It maintains a fiercely rich atmosphere all the way through, and the presence of evil only begins to manifest stronger and stronger when Orly begins reading from a book of arcane magic she crudely made up herself, casting an ominous shadow over her both figuratively and literally. The film is notably abrasive with its barrage of differing religious signs, symbols and connotations. Much of what the siblings experience focus on how ritualized much of our existence is, both morally and spiritually and how steadfast we are on beliefs and ideas that speak to us. The shadow that washes over Orly as she reads from a book she completely made up strongly suggests that the overriding horror is a tulpa, the concept of believing something into existence. It's reinforced each time Orly introduces a new component to her ritual that Nathan takes as genuine, thus manifesting his fears and demons into reality. For example, one night Orly warns Nathan of Cerebus, a three-headed dog guarding the gates of hell from mere mortals, leaving Nathan frightened and later claiming to hear the shackles of its collar growing closer and closer to camp. However, as their fears intensify and the real possibility of danger begins to grow stronger, so does the physical manifestation of Nathan's fears, as Cerebus's chains begin to actually appear, along with an ambiguous POV that chases the siblings, akin to the presence from Evil Dead. In my eyes, the story sets up Orly to indirectly become a spiritual antagonist to Nathan, because despite her motivation to ease Nathan's conscience, she's continually introducing him to new ideas about demons and hell, thus, as Tulpa mythology suggests, means she's essentially creating this elaborate nightmare realm that Nathan slowly becomes a victim to. By the end, her blasphemous meddling concoction of beliefs unintentionally turns a peaceful, dreamy summer forest with somber undertones into a volatile, demonic SCP underworld where her fiction becomes a reality. 
To say it's all in their heads is reductive to how real the existence of evil in this forest becomes. It could partially be hallucination, sure, but something which the filmmakers discussed in an interview with Fangoria is how they developed Antrim so that the viewer would engage in self-reflection on the power of their own beliefs and fears. In basic terms, it leans heavily on the power of suggestion. What is it that we personally bring to the table when we attempt to decipher cryptic concepts and imagery? The most elusive detail is Orly telling Nathan that her instructions and the book were given to her by Ike, an entity who seems to intrude Nathan's visions despite him supposedly being a fabrication as well. And then there's Orly explaining that most demons typically hide behind disguises, like this crudely animated stop-motion squirrel that, honestly, even I'd suspect it's a demon with a face like that. The film is then broken into five layers subtitled in Latin that I suspect are a nod to the circles of hell in Dante's Inferno. The first layer, Nefastus, meaning contrary to sacred rites, religion, and judgment, or at least that's what I think it means, uh, I just quickly googled these words, you can totally correct me if I'm wrong, sees them discover a loaded gun, Chekhov's to be exact, and encounter a man praying to a rabbit, presumably that of his daughters, before attempting to disembowel himself in a Japanese ritual. Nathan intervenes and disrupts the man's attempt, leaving him to wander off apologetically in a despondent state, which left me to theorize that this man killed his daughter because, with my limited knowledge of this suicide ritual, it's sometimes performed out of shame, and given the connotations of hell, he's technically in a place of punishment, and the next time we see him, well, he's literally being cooked alive by demons. The second lair Maleficus, meaning evildoer and what I think is referring to orally, sees her attempt to finish her quest by hiding Maxine's collar that Nathan is asked to forfeit as an offering before entering the forest, so that when he finds it, he'll know her soul is at peace. However, Orly's deceptive yet seemingly noble plans are thwarted when Nathan then claims that they've entered the third lair, Demonium, which speaks for itself, much to Orly's bewilderment, where they encounter two cannibals who Nathan had premonitions of as demons in disguise. The siblings find the cannibals engaging in bestiality while cooking the Japanese man alive in a satanic effigy wicker man style, calling back to Nathan's nightmares, causing the siblings to rightfully beal the fuck out of there, before finding themselves going in circles Blair Witch style, when they end up back at their campsite. Orly attempts to calm Nathan's fears and stop the madness by revealing that her ritual is entirely a hoax. However, Nathan admits full awareness of her plans, by claiming to have spoken to the mysterious Ike prior to their adventure. He tells Orly that Ike warns him that Orly would try to trick him and not to believe her plan, hence his appearance to Nathan during Orly's attempt to plant the dog collar in Maleficus. This is the reason I see Maleficus, evildoer, as a reference to her, because since she claimed that the book was written by Ike, the power of the tulpa makes it so, meaning he is in control of the layers they find themselves in. This takes us to the fourth layer, Incarnatus S. Mestos, or Fear Incarnate, which shows us visions of Maxine attacking Nathan and his traumatic vision of Cerebus before the siblings are captured by the cannibals. Oh yeah, shit, I should probably address this now since it's absolutely the most enigmatic part of the film. Uh, remember earlier when I said the film potentially could have been tampered with? Well, there's apparently a snuff film spliced into it where a bound couple are presumably ritualistically sacrificed given the Adam and Eve connotation, you know, eating the forbidden fruit and being cast out of the Garden of Eden, like the way the devil was cast out of heaven as punishment. It being both jarringly inconsequential and unexplained greatly adds to the chilling allure, because when the closing parts of the documentary attempt to address features within the film, it builds up this image of something so heavily modified with scratch conflicting occult and spiritual beliefs, that it's essentially this Lovecraftian Necronomicon, much like what Orly creates within the film, and inadvertently places in the hands of a demon. It's like mixing poisonous chemicals to make a bomb, whatever it is goes beyond heaven and hell, it's pure death and evil. Back in the film, Orly awakens in a cage and manages to escape and rescue Nathan, as the cannibals attempt to cook him alive, shooting both men dead as Nathan flees deep into the forest, triggering the fifth and final lair, Abyssus. Here we see Nathan, alone, dirty, exhausted, scared, I mean, he literally just escaped an inferno, and before long 
he follows the signs of a seemingly innocent whimper, discovering that the Elusa Cerebus is simply a scared dog caught in a bear trap. Upon releasing it, Nathan begins to smile, symbolically believing the goal of freeing Maxine's soul is now actually complete and his fears are over, we can finally absolve ourselves into a peaceful happily ever after. The end, a brother and sister triumphant. That's it, you can go home now, the movie's over! <laughs> okay, so going back to Orly, she's pursued by the demons that she created and attempts to eradicate the book to end the madness but as we know, it's no longer hers, it's Ike's. Alone in her tent, she begins hearing the shackles of Cerebus. Unbeknownst to her, it's actually Nathan dragging the bear trap back to camp, and as she raises Chekhov's gun ready to accidentally shoot her brother, the movie abruptly ends with the snuff footage and Ike staring deep into our soul. So, I hear some of you ask, Ryan, what the hell just happened? Well, to be honest, your guess is as good as mine. I think my tulpa theory holds up pretty well, but then again, I like talking about tulpas for some reason, but the film does attempt to give us some context to the madness. During the credits, an investigation attempts to explain several of the circumstances, most notably the auditory illusions I mentioned at the beginning, and sigils superimposed over various frames that are easy to dismiss as film scratches. For example, the film makes recurring use of triangular imagery that one expert explains has different meanings to different cultures, like the Holy Trinity to the West, illumination and manifestation to the East, and a summoning sign to the occult. When we add these three meanings together and refer to Orly's Frankenstein book of beliefs that Ike has assumed control of, we can treat the fact that her final scene is superimposed with a triangle as a signal to the punishment she now faces for inadvertently summoning evil into our world. However, if my tulpa theory doesn't hold weight, we can turn to this theologist's perspective who calls attention to this one particular symbol for the demon Astaroth, which appears over 170 times throughout the film, that he claims is a demon that relishes in playing with its victims, much like how Ike does to Orly. The theologist recites a supposedly true story in late 1600s France, where a circle of magicians believed the local children were influenced by Satan, causing them to trigger Astaroth, and two weeks later the entire village was murdered and the magicians had gouged out their eyes. As the filmmakers explained in their interview with Fangoria, the point of the film is to show how powerful belief can be. One researcher in the film even calls the influence of rituals designed to kill as caused by self-willed death. The rituals themselves have no physical effect, but people are motivated by a belief that's powered by fear, which has held a stranglehold on humankind since the dawn of time. And that is Antrim, the deadliest film ever made. In its opinion. While it does arguably tell too much rather than show in evoking reactions to its horror, you can't deny its boldness and ambition for doing something more experimental with the genre and how it plays with ambiguity in general, so if you have your own thoughts, comments and interpretations, please leave them below, and until next time, stay safe, stay away from Astaroth, and I'll see you all very soon. Bye.